Good afternoon, everybody who is in the Central and Eastern time zones. I think we are just hitting noon for those of us who are on the West Coast. My name is Desmond Martin. I am the program coordinator for Next Wave STEM, and I am so glad to have each and every one of you with us as we discuss how to teach drones remotely. Uh, I'm really, really excited because Next Wave STEM continues to push for with respect to the way things have changed for all of us as educators. Um, some of us have been <laughs> stressed out, if we're really frankly honest, with trying to make the transition to remote learning and distance learning, um, more likely distance learning than remote learning for our students for the remainder of the school year. Um, some of us are having to consider plans with respect to what we are going to be doing in the fall. Um, and we are right there with you. Um, as we hit a new paradigm in the way that we think in the wake of COVID-19, we want to make sure um, that we are sensitive to your needs as educators when it comes to teaching STEM and teaching hands-on, and even doing that at a distance. So really, really excited to talk about um, that subject today. Um, so first, uh, a couple of housekeeping items, um, and the primary one being that we are in webinar mode today. That means that uh, even though I'm sure everyone is camera ready, we will not be able to see your faces and we won't hear your audio. Um, but don't worry, that does not mean that you are in a black box. Um, if you want to share your comments or concerns or questions, we've got a couple of moments that I'm going to be pausing, um, just getting some feedback from you. The chat application is available. Um, you can jump in the chat and share with us um, already. Some of you have been sharing where you're from and um, what you teach, and we'd certainly appreciate you. Uh, if you want to keep things a little more anonymous, the Q&A functionality is also available. So that means that you can go ahead and, and um, let me know the question, uh, and we'll make sure that we get it answered live on air if we can. Uh, I also want to um, call out my colleague, Sagundi. Uh, she is on the line as a panelist. She's going to get a chance a little bit later to talk about what NetSwave STEM can do specifically when it comes to empowering your schools with curricula and some things that we've got going on for the summer as well. Uh, already, we've got <laughs> engaged participants. I love it. Um, the question is whether this webinar will be recorded. The answer is yes. Um, following this webinar, all of our participants here today will be receiving an email with a couple of items. Um, the first is a recording of this webinar, but also this webinar will include a copy of the slide deck for your reference. Um, the second thing you'll receive, and this is primarily for our Illinois educators, um, is a copy of your PD certificate hour. Um, you'll be able to submit that form to the Illinois uh, School Board. Uh, or Board of Education, sorry, slipping myself uh, there, not enough caffeine. Uh, you'll be able to submit that form document and claim your hour of professional development. Um, we hear you, those who are not in Illinois, we aren't quite there yet with offering uh, accredited PD hours everywhere, but we are working on it and we hope to be doing that soon. Um, and the last thing you will be receiving is access to our curricula. Uh, we want to make sure that you have the ability to actually get hands on with the teaching material on um, those things that are both student facing and primarily teacher facing as well. Um, so you will have the opportunity to sign up for that curricula for free. Um, so we're tying all those things into the package for you just for being here today. Don't worry, there's no cost to you at all. And of course, if you've got any questions, um, you can direct them to either me or my colleague, Sagundi. So I've already said a mouthful. We haven't even got it started yet. Uh, and we've got <laughs> quite a bit to cover and a little bit of time to get there. So with all that being said, we will jump right into it. So. An amazing place to begin is at the beginning. Um, and that's telling you a little bit more about Next Wave STEM, who we are, what we do, what we believe. Um, and without reading anything on the slide, what we 
deeply believe more than anything is that our children are the future problem solvers that we need honestly right now um, we are facing some massive massive challenges and we've seen stem being marshaled to rise to those challenges in really inspiring ways in the last couple of months um, students people that we are working with have already been 3d printing ppe um, we have seen students in the past printing things like prosthetic parts we see students using drones to do um, actual surveyor work for their properties using those in industry um, we've seen students who have been using drones uh, to actually explore the ability to do deliveries. Um, so more and more, when we face complicated issues like COVID-19, I hate to say it, but it is right in front of us, but even more existential crises like climate change or the grand scheme of how are we gonna feed 8 billion people, for example. Um, we want to empower our students to know, not just feel, but know that they belong in STEM fields, that those are fields that they can flourish in, that they can contribute to, and that they can add solutions to. Um, I always tell students, and I tell anyone that I speak with Next Wave STEM about, that our goal is to transform our students today from just being consumers of technology to being creators of technology. And as we're doing that, um, we recognize your role as an educator. Um, if our students don't have those resources to learn, um, they won't, <laughs> to put it quite frankly. Um, so it's so important that for our, our educators who have, are always looking for new ways to engage students, to get students hands on, um, who may feel themselves to be technolo technologically challenged themselves, or um, aren't sure about where to start with an emerging technology, um, that's why we exist. Uh, we make it easy to teach. We provide you the curricula. We provide you the hands-on training. Um, and we are going to talk more about some of the different things that we do. Um, but we want to empower you so that you can empower our students to, frankly, save the world. Uh, more about myself personally, I am the program coordinator for Next Wave STEM. I've been with Next Wave STEM for the past two and a half half years. Uh, my professional background is in mechanical engineering and education. Uh, so I've got a little bit of a hand when it comes to developing for the emerging technology that we're going to be talking about today, but also writing our curricula. And uh, I love to get into the weeds when it comes to talking about curricula. So um, that's my long way of saying that any questions that you have, I'm really excited to answer them. So we have two things that we want to accomplish primarily in today's webinar. Um, and the way that we can think about that um, is to think about how we can use our technology platform, the one that we use at Next Wave STEM called TeloEDU to teach students about using zones. Um, that is going, you're going to find to be really, really powerful. Um, and powerful from the perspective that we can get hands on um, with technology coding so that we're flying drones autonomously um, and we're doing that in a virtual environment but powerful also because it prepares our students to do hands-on coding with a real drone um, it is simple as one click to go from the digital drone that we're going to see today to a real world drone that your students are able to get hands on or that you can make available to them through um, your resources at school. Um, so that's why we love that. That is an easy step up to actually fly in an actual real autonomous drone. Um, but the second thing we want to do is talk about effective remote learning instructional methodologies. Um, we want to make sure that you just don't see what the technology is capable of and how that can apply to students, but you have a better sense of what it would look like to teach a hands on technology methodology in a distance learning scenario. Um, we know that can be extremely difficult. We know that there are questions with regards to students' abilities to use equipment since they may not have access to the equipment. If the equipment lives at the school or they don't have the physical funds and resources to get access to the equipment, um, what can we do about that? How can we still teach effectively? 
that's what we'll talk about in the back half of the webinar. So uh, with all that being said, um, if we're cool with those two goals, we will go ahead and press forward and talk about our particular drone um, platform, which is Tello EDU. And to do that, really more than anything, we want to understand the coding environment. Um, Tello EDU is an education drone platform. Um, we love it because um, students will have the opportunity to code that drone. Um, but as they're coding the drone, um, it's not JavaScript. It's not HTML. Uh, it's not CSS. Um, it's not what you might even consider a higher order coding language. It is block-based coding that allows them to control a physical drum. So the barrier of entry for our students who don't have lots and lots of computer science experience is very low. Students get the chance to learn the concepts and understand more and more what's happening and then build up the linguistic skills with respect to a particular coding language. It becomes very versatile that way. So in order to do that, we actually have access to Tello EDU. Tello EDU is a mobile application. It's something that you can run on a tablet or a cell phone really, really well. Um, it connects not only to a virtualized um, flying environment for the drone, but what it does is it connects directly to the physical drone as well to allow the block-based coding to turn into real-world physical action. As it's doing that, it's also giving us the ability to get live sensor output, which becomes an extremely powerful tool for when our students are using our drones hands-on. So, of course, we have to think about what a drone does. Um, but before we think about what a drone does, I'm actually going to transition and show us Tello EDU in action. So I'm going to change the screen share over to our Tello EDU application. Um, what we see running right here is the Tello EDU app. I'm running it um, on my computer as an emulation. Um, but if you are going to download this on iOS or Android or even onto a Chromebook, um, it will look the exact same way. Um, it's gamified, which means that students can progress through levels in order to build their skills. But with the curricula that we've written for Next Wave STEM, um, we don't focus on the games. We get right to the meat and we are focused specifically on the block based coding and environment, which looks like this when I click on the screen puzzle piece. The block based coding environment is empty white space. And for those of us who are familiar with Scratch, with block based coding, it's going to be something that, even though it's skinned a little bit differently, is immediately familiar. Um, when we talk about block based coding, we're actually talking about the ability to give instructions to the machine, in this case, the drone. And without having to write out those instructions specifically, we can put them together in a way to make the drone do what we want. So in my case, I would tell the drone that I would want it to take off. I'm going to snap it together with that button that says tap to start. We tell it to take off. From there, I might tell the drone that I want it to fly forward for a distance, in this case, 100 centimeters. And then I would tell the drone that I want it to land. So just that quickly, I've written a complete program for autonomous flight, flight for a drone. Three simple steps that would include me doing a whole lot of computer logic and learning a language. That's what makes it so accessible. Now, this is all fine and good. It's instructions, but how can I relate that to something that my students can understand? Well, the meat of that lives in our virtualization, our simulation ability here inside the application. So when I click on this eyeball icon that's in the bottom left-hand corner of the application, Upon clicking that, I'm now thrown into a 3D visualization and simulation of the actual drum. So here is where all of our extraction lives. Our ability to 
actually give our machine instructions and see those instruct instructions carried out. So when I click on the tap start button, my drone takes off, flies forward, and then lands. Very simple program, but really illustrative of what's going to happen as our students interact with the drone. And for the benefit of showing a little bit more of what this looks like from a three dimensional perspective, I'm going to hit tap start and then rotate our camera a little bit. So we can actually see our drone is moving in those three dimensions. Really, really useful, really, really powerful platform because it's accessible, but also powerful in the capabilities. So over in this left hand menu, this motion category does exactly what it sounds like. It is giving us access to the motions that we can program in for the drone. Um, these include some things that we absolutely have to see for the drone to, to fly. Um, in this case, takeoff. If we don't tell our drone to take off, it will stay on the ground and it won't follow any of the other instructions. So that becomes a must have. Um, the motion plots control motions in those three dimensions. Um, up and down being our Z axis, um, forward and back is our X axis, left and right is our Y axis. But we also have the ability to think um, more deeply with regard to angle sense and even 3D Cartesian planes. Um, so we can program in a rotation. Um, that's that left yaw. Um, I will actually show an example of that by nesting that into our program and open up motion again. Um, we have right yaw that is actually detailing the rotation of the drone. Um, we have some, uh, I guess you could call them just for fun motions when we think about flips. So um, the interesting thing about that is that they're celebratory, they're really fun, they build a segment for our students, but when we think about expanding later on, um, they give us some actually powerful functionalities. And then um, we can control things like how the drone will fly in diagonals using X, Y, and Z coordinates, or even how the drone can do curves. So now that I've kind of pulled in more of the motion blocks, um, I can press tap to start. And we can see that drone fly forward, rotate, and then execute that flip. So we got more and more of a sense of the way that this drone is going to move. Um, keeping in that same vein, working down through our categories of blocks, our control is our more formalized programmatic knowledge. Um, instead of writing 50 blocks of code to make my drone do what I wanted to do, uh, maybe I'll tell my drone that I want it to repeat instructions of a certain amount. And I can modify how much and how many times that our drone repeats. Um, not going to dig too much into the weeds there. Those of us who are a little familiar with computer programming have this idea of forks and loops, um, things like breakouts that all live inside of our control block. Um, Boolean logic as well. Um, I'll talk about operators and sensors, but our ability to con to program in conditional if then statements is available to us and the ability to also break out of loops. Um, that will become really powerful later on. Um, we have a question. Oh, really good question. Lynn asks, what is the object over the drone? Um, I'm going to kind of circle it with my cursor. The object over the drone is actually the way that we know the drone's orientation. Um, this is a really, really great question. Um, what we see is the arrow pointing forward. That is the direction of the camera on your drone. Um, the reason why that's useful information to know is that our drone um, is not the most sophisticated when it comes to its ability to locate itself in three-dimensional space. It can measure really well uh, acceleration, um, rotation, um, and uh, the amount of tilt um, at any given time in the speed, those things it measures really well. Um, what it doesn't measure very well at all is its position in space. There is no GPS sensor on the drone. So the drone 
if you're flying physically will be flown by a line of sight it becomes really important for you to recognize which direction your drone is in if you're flying the drone manually and very important to recognize um, the orientation of your drone at the beginning of the flight when you give instructions um, there's a difference between blindfolding someone and telling them to walk forward when there's nothing in front of them and then blindfolding someone and telling them to walk forward when they're on the edge of a cliff. Um, the drone doesn't know anything about the environment around it um, with respect to where it is on the planet Earth. So we have to make sure that we set our drone up accordingly. Um, really, really good question. Um, returning now to this idea of um, ways that we can use the drone in the categories of programming we have, um, we have our variables. We're able to actually define um, blocks in mathematical and logical ways and name them whatever we want. So in this case, I can click on this button and it's going to give me the option to create a variable name. And for those of us who are math teachers, I might want to name this variable pi. And as soon as I do, I've got this button here that says pi, and I can click this button next to it that says create variable. When I do that, I've created a block that has no value, but now I can assign a value to. So I can grab a block that says set, and I can grab another block and tell pi to be some kind of value. Um, really powerful because we can change that value later on. Algebraic thinking is really pulled into everything that we do when you fly our drones. But this is nothing if we can't actually express our numbers. And we can do that using our operator blocks. Um, our operator blocks not only give us the ability to add and subtract, just do basic arithmetic, but we can think logically um, using Boolean logic. So two values in comparison to one another and how that will um, impact what happens with our drone. Um, we can take random, random samplings in between two values. We can even think about a, a minimum and maximum value or an absolute value of a, of a figure. Um, so what we're doing is we're really honing in and detailing with the minutia of the way that the drone would respond, um, not just to our input values, but also into what the drone senses. So an example may be to consider what the temperature, what the maximum temperature is in an environment. And I'm actually gonna chop our code up a little bit. Um, we might want to consider what the temperature is going to be in an environment. So I'm gonna change the control and write a program that says, if, you now tag on a land at the end, if, and I'm gonna use operators, the maximum temperature is greater than, let's say in this case, 32 degrees. then the drone will execute this code and then land. Um, that becomes our option and our availability with the drone. And this is really autonomous flight. Um, the ability for the drone to take in information about the outside world um, and then fly accordingly, or just fly the instructions that we've given to the drone without me having to adjust the control inputs to the drone. Um, and all of that we can simulate right in our drone program. So I'm actually going to transition back to our slideshow. Um, what is a drone? A drone um, can be defined not by necessarily what it is, but what it does. And simply, it uses those sensors that we talk about, gyroscopes, accelerometers, uh, radar sensors, infrared radar, um, or even things like a barometer so it can measure how high it is in the air column and it can use those sensors to usually follow a simple directive um, go from one place to another place um, are there student challenges within this app 
Um, really good question. The answer is yes. Um, that gamified uh, perspective that we saw on the home screen takes our students to challenges that teaches them more and more how to actually code the drone and get the drone to behave in ways that they want it to behave. Um, got another really good question. Is the temperature Fahrenheit or Celsius? It is in Celsius. Um, what we have found and what the app developer has found, that's an international app developer outside the United States, um, is that the metric units are really, really good for doing scientific inquiry and exploration, but also allowing the drone to fly with precision. Um, we're flying the drone in increments of centimeters, um, which one is a manageable um, unit of measurement even indoors. Um, so you don't have to worry about your drone flying at a, at a high speed into a, a wall or wanting to fly um, three miles <laughs> down the road. Um, it's manageable in terms of speed and distance, um, but also with regards to relaying scientific information. Um, it moves in a way that makes sense. Um, so we are working in metric units. Uh, but that also provides us the opportunity for our students who are not that familiar with metric units. Um, and this is actually built into our curriculum for them to do unit conversion as units that make more sense to them. Really, really good question. So uh, now I want to pause a little bit and I'm showing you a little bit of what the drone can do. I want your feedback and here is the main question, that chance for you to uh, feedback with us. Uh, oh, my slide got cut off a little bit, so I'm going to have to say this verbally. Um, what is an example of a way, uh, an application, an abstraction, an activity that you can have your students code your drone to do? Um, so I'll give an example. Um, maybe we can code our drone to fly a pencil from one countertop to another countertop. That's an example of something that I can program my small drone to do autonomously. Um, I want you to apply your imagination. Um, and I'll just give you a minute where I'll be a little quiet, but think about what is something that you can make the drone do as an example of how the drone can fly. Oh, Eric, right away, really good, landing on a target. Ah, Melissa, an obstacle course with targets uh, and hula hoops. That's awesome. I love it. The ability to place the drone where we want it to go. Really good example. What else might you make the drone do? Another really good one, picking up objects using magnets. Absolutely. Can we program it to take pictures? That functionality is on the way. The developer is still working on it and it's taking a little bit of time during the disruptions. Um, so right now it's not in the drag and drop programming, but the drone can take pictures. Really good question. Uh, flying through cardboard boxes. Yeah, that's a good one. And it's really, really hard as well <laughs> for a multitude of reasons. Severing things from point A to point B. It's a Gundy right on top of it. Where there are all kinds of different ways we can think about abstractions of what our drones are able to do. Um, and we can show an example. Um, this is a little bit more complicated, but I'm thinking of what this might look like for your students at home who are, might not have access to the drum. So the first thing we would do is use an open source map. We're going to use an, an abstraction. Um, in this case, you could use something like Google Maps or Google Earth. Um, for those of you who are just really baked into that Apple ecosystem, even Apple Maps <laughs> will serve uh, the purpose here. Um, it's freely available resources and it provides us with something that's really critical, which is distance information about things in the real world. Um, using that bar scale in the lower right hand corner um, becomes a way for our students to think about the distances that drones will be able to fly and what they can code in their app, 
it's the way that they would respond to actual real world distances. So that becomes our first foundational step is to think about, okay, what actual space do we have in the real world? Either something that you can pull down from an online resource or something that may be around you, say your backyard. How much space do you have to fly? Um, from there, we can um, help our students create a plan. Um, if you are flying a park, how do you want to fly around the park? Um, what's that pattern going to look like and why? Um, if we are just doing surveillance, we want to explore the park. I want to see something I've never seen before, and I may have some restrictions. I may still be in shelter in place, but I want to go out and see more of the park. And once I've identified the area and have an idea about the flight plan and have an idea about the distances, um, that question pops out for us, that learning opportunity. Um, what should those flight instructions look like? So that's where our app comes in, where we build in um, how we want to see our drone fly, our understanding of distances and the bar scale, and then using the code, in this case, operators, um, building in values on top of values to make our drone fly more specifically the way that we want our drone to fly. And from there, we can actually help our students construct that code to fly in abstraction. Um, I've taken out some of the more juicy bits here, um, but what we've done is we've estimated those distances for this flight plan just using um, these red arrows. We've used the bar scale to estimate those distances to fly a rectangle. And we can see that rectangular flight um, mapped out and represented in our code. Um, if I can quickly count, two, four, six, eight, nine, nine um, blocks of instructions will allow this code to fly or allow this drone to fly in this rectangular pattern around um, the park that we designated. So we can make these connections to real world spaces and real world distances into our code. Um, and then we also now have the ability to build our understanding for our students. Um, I can estimate the distance, um, but what other information do I need to know? Um, so we're thinking about expanding our students' mathematic and mathematical um, considerations for drones movement, um, but also really questioning the integrity of, okay, what do you know about angles? What do you know about distances? How can you put these things together to describe the motion of an object? Um, long story short, we're, we're jumping all over so many NGSS standards, it becomes really, really fun. I got a question here. Um, don't you have to tell it how far to go up when taking off? Yes, really great question. Um, the drone, when it takes off, does have a standard takeoff height of 50 centimeters. So if I need to tell the drone to fly higher um, to avoid people, or lawnmowers or dogs that have never seen a drone before and would love to catch one. That may be something I need to consider. So already we're looking at the code that I've given the drone and seeing ways that we can improve upon it. I love it. I love people looking at the examples and say, you know what, this is a decent example, but I think it could be better. That's awesome. Yes, we can absolutely modify this particular code this example code and think about, okay, what would work better for my classroom? Or what should my students consider? Um, we're already thinking of like autonomous drone engineers. So with that being said, we know what the drone can do and we have some examples of ways that we can um, interact with our students and really engage them with how they were programmed the drone. Um, which is all fine and good, but we have to ask ourselves and really answer the question, okay, what is the practical way that this gets executed in the classroom? Um, what makes sense? Um, lots of you have already been doing distance learning instruction and have been working um, with your technology partners and working with other teachers and administrators and working with parents and working with students to find out the times and the formats and the ways of engagement that are most effective and you're still experimenting and still working. Um, at Next Wave STEM, as we've transitioned um, to doing distance learning, 
with our instructors, um, we put together an instructional model that we think is really effective when it comes to hands-on learning. And we think it's gonna be effective for you in the classroom, um, whether you're doing hands-on with drones, technology, simulating the drone or flying a real drone if your student has access to a drone. Um, or um, in this case, um, flying just specifically virtually. What do we actually do in the classroom? We break it down into five structures, five E's, and those five E's are, are a methodology that many of you may be already familiar with. Um, we engage, explore, um, have our students explain and have them elaborate um, once they are interacting with their technology and trying to solve a particular challenge or, or explore or investigate a specific pure piece of that technology. And then we evaluate what they've learned. And in this case, this is what that actually looks like pulled um, with engaging its whole group direct live instructor. Um, that's you in the video chat with your students live. Um, some of them may already be trying to hang that wallpaper, that printout of themselves in front of their webcam, but that's you one to one through the computer screen with your students. Um, and thinking about a real world application, not something in the abstract, um, one train leaves from Marrakesh and the other leaves from, um, from Tunisia, and when will they intersect? Um, no, we wanna think about things that are tangible to our students. Um, from there, um, we wanna do whole group collaboration. Um, and this is also moderated by you as the instructor. Um, we're asking problems, we're digging, are asking questions and solving those problems um, and digging into more of what our students think, their ability to contribute to the conversation. From there, we will also explore through small group collaboration. Um, this is where our students get to drive their learning even more. Um, at Next Wave STEM, we believe in the power of teamwork for our students who go on to pursue careers in engineering. Um, they will be working in teams for the rest of their careers. Um, and, and almost any job that they'll do anyway, they'll have to work together with other human beings effectively as team members. Um, can they effectively work together in small groups, smaller groups than your whole class size and uh, collaborate on the solution? Um, from there, we will go back into you know, all inclusive um, modeling by the instructor. Um, you've explored, you've shared some things, if you can't get it or if you did get it, maybe I'll show you how we get there. We'll share the skill, share the solution. Um, or we turn you once again, our student into our instructor for our classmates. Um, that idea of sharing what you planned and trying it out live, the interactivity becomes super critical. Um, once we've done the explain, while the students have been able to share and the instructors are able to share, um, elaborate. Why is this your solution? Why does it work? Um, what things are still lingering questions? What challenges do we face? That is individual work. And that's something that your students have access to away from your live class time um, through your learning management system, whether that's Moodle or Google Classroom. And then as an instructor after the class, independent of that live instructional time, um, you have the ability to differentiate the instruction um, knowing more about your students' specific needs and specific struggles, um, using that data that you're gathering, once again, through your LMS, to talk about what's happening, um, and really to kind of take the pressure off in a situation where um, that live face-to-face -face interaction with the student is, is difficult, maybe a little bit more stressful. Um, for some of our students, this becomes an opportunity to empower our students with our feedback. So we've laid out quite a bit here, um, but nothing really specific with where do we begin. So that's our next point of feedback from you as a teacher. Um, if this is your lesson progression, if this is what happens in the classroom, we have to begin with that real world problem that we want our technology to solve. 
um, what's the real thing that our drone can do? And that's the question for you. Um, this is the second time that I'll be a little bit more quiet and ask, what's a real world problem that students can engage in using drones? And the chat is open for your answers. It's a little quiet, so, oh, there we go. Just as I'm saying that, yes, Eric and Stanley are already searching for missing pets in a time where that might have been a community effort, but now we have to be a little bit physically distanced. That's a great way to use a drone. Delivering medicines to remote areas. Um, there are startups backed by very large tech companies that are doing that good work right now. Really, really great example. Um, in remote areas, we also think about those as developing countries. Um, there are plenty of remote areas right here in the United States where people struggle to get access to critical resources. Something like drone delivery is being considered for our own um, citizens in the United States. Uh, kids can fly the drone to carry a message to send to grandparents during COVID-19. Yes, people love handwritten letters. Um, we've also heard stories of the way that our our structural um, male infrastructure is actually straining right now. Um, drones might be part of the solution. Checking damage to area after tornado, absolutely. Um, especially for our students who are more rural, are checking a large area or for our urban students. Um, if you're checking um, in a really elevated position on the house or even a, a high rise, that would be very difficult or maybe even costly to check um, via completely manual means. A drone might be a really good way to do that. Um, Melissa also flying in, coming in there, thinking about flood damage, things that our drones are doing. Um, in our Q&A, yes, the delivery system. How can we get things delivered? Search and rescue. Absolutely. Um, when we think about the Paradise Fires out in California a couple years ago, we saw drones in use actively to do search and rescue. Uh, oh, that's an interesting consideration. Um, the agricultural industry taking soil samples. That's really, really good. I hadn't considered that before, but drones absolutely could be used to take soil samples um, remotely for the agri um, agricultural industry. Um, really great examples from really, really prescient um, as to some applications in the near future or even now that we may see drones um, fulfilling. But you know me, I love examples. So the example I use is the one that you all have. Um, having our students practice citizen engineering, um, not just in creating an object to solve a problem, but creating processes to solve problems. Um, when we think about essential and remote delivery, um, medicines, um, food, um, we may be thinking about postage um, for those who are not available um, to receive postage in really difficult situations. Um, our United States Postal Service is, is constitutionally mandated to get mail everywhere. Um, that's something that we have to consider. Um, but also, we have to think about drones ability to be assistive protective devices. Um, I'm thinking about our drones that have the ability to go into situations that have become more dangerous. Um, for some of us who have pets um, and are living in highly populated areas, um, I've seen drones walking dogs here in Illinois. Um, well, not me personally, but we've seen that story in the news. Um, and Melissa just dropped in that she has been watching Joan Animal Spy Cams lately. Um, Jones are becoming really more interesting ways, really more legitimate ways in which to carry out some of these um, essential functions that we do as people. So when we think about moving through the other portions of our lesson progression, 
um, we are always considering collaboration, um, how we get the student engaged with the material um, using not just the physical technology, the equipment of the drone or the drone simulator, but the equipment that you have available as an instructor. Um, in this case, that's primarily um, your video chat application. Um, learn your tools. Um, if it's Zoom, become a screen share master. Know how to share which screen you want to share, know how to share from your phone, know how to share from a second screen, know how to not share or to control share or to set up someone else to share. Um, I'm sure many of you are going to be continuously developing your professional skills in order to do this um, and take advantage of other useful features like whiteboard and annotation. Um, document collaboration is something that's really growing. Um, Microsoft just last week held their build conference, of course, completely digital and online this year. And they're focusing for Microsoft 365 to add functionality that allows, allows for live collaboration across document types. Uh, I'm not going to jump way too in the weeds on that because one, I don't know when that's going to arrive for Microsoft 365 customers and schools. And two, I'm just a nerd who loves that kind of thing. I remember Google Wave way back in the day, the first time I saw live document collaboration, and it made my heart sing. Um, for our schools that are G Suite schools, um, two things like using your dots, slides, and sheets to live collaborate. Um, have students in real time submitting their content, submitting their questions via Google Slides. You might assign a single slide per student, and that gives students the ability to actually flip through, not just on their own work, but looking at other students' um, actual considerations. Um, it's a way for them to really add together and be engaged and not just be thinking about what they're doing, and also allows for you to be an instructor to kind of peek on everybody's work and maybe give feedback in real time all at the same time. Super powerful tool. I'm a huge fan of live document collaboration. Um, but when we also think about elaborating and evaluating, that's where our 3D management system can come into play. Um, our documentation, our notes, our worksheets, our actual code, our screenshots, all of those things can be uploaded into whatever learning management system we use whether that's Google Classroom, Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, Accord, whatever you use, it's really designed to allow your students to take what was once strictly uh, manual and physical assets and make them digital. Um, once again, become your learning management system master. So at this point, I'm actually gonna pause and turn things over to my colleague, Sagundi Chigani, because she's going to talk about more specifically, um, now that I've hit you with a fire hose of information, um, the specific real world stuff that we're doing when it comes to learning models um, that will help you on your school. So Sagundi, I'm going to invite you to open up your mic and take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Des. Uh, hope everyone has been enjoying this awesome session by Des. Uh, everyone knows he does a bunch of these a couple times a week, so definitely want to invite you to take more. Um, so I just wanted to jump in really quickly to talk about our offerings. We are currently partnering with schools. We're partnering with camp districts. We're partnering with park districts kind of all over to bring engaging, high-quality STEM learning right to the student's laptop. So all of the stuff that we'll be doing moving forward with regards to teaching is virtual. Um, we currently have six courses that we're offering. One, as is on the slide, is the hands-on experience. So we have three courses under that, ro drones, robotics, 3D printing, and then we also have the online experience. And the difference between these two is that anyone can do the online experience with just their laptop uh, or any sort of device, Chromebook, anything like that. With the hands-on experience, uh, students will receive equipment. So they'll have these STEM kits delivered, which is either a robot, a drone, a 3D printer. So that way they can you know, really get in there and do the things that we may do in the classes that we teach. Um, we are very happy to share more information with you about this. 
uh, you can feel free to reach out to me. I will drop my email uh, directly in the chat as well. And we're also offering this to any families that want it. So you don't have to be part of a school system or a camp district. You know, if you'd like to sign up, um, you know, any children that you know, or if you know that parents that want to do this, we're very happy to work with them directly. Uh, uh, what it comes down to for us is that we just want to make sure kids continue to learn uh, within the STEM field. We know that right now, you know, reading takes precedence, math takes precedence, but I think people are starting to see that they really want their kids to be engaged in different ways. Um, and we definitely want to avoid the summer slide as well. So keeping learning on track with us is a great way to do that. Thanks, Des. That's all from me. Thanks so much, Sugandhi. Um, so long story short is reach out to us. Um, you'll be receiving follow-up emails about ways that you can access our hands-on and virtual offerings this summer um, for your students. I think it's going to be a great time and an awesome way for them to continue their journey in STEM. So uh, we have finally come to that pin ultimate slide uh, where we get a chance to uh, engage with you and your questions. I know we hit you with a lot of information, uh, but if you have questions about anything that we've covered, whether it's the physical drone itself or the software or our learning methodology with regards to using drones, uh, I'm going to uh, hush up for a little bit again and let those questions come rolling in. We seem to be all quiet on the Western and Eastern and Northern and Southern fronts when it comes to questions today, which is just fine. Uh, we know that there's a lot of information to synthesize here. Um, this may be your first time even considering teaching drones. And if this is a whole lot, um, there's no problem with that at all. Um, we are so excited to communicate with you via email about your questions. Uh, so Gandhi just asked one, um, what are some tips that I'd offer to anyone who's teaching STEM remotely? Um, that is a great, great question. We are going to see lots of teachers, not just teaching STEM, but um, language skills and just core mathematics, um, those things that are so important for um, assessment and understanding our students' um, skill and cognitive and emotional growth. Those are things that um, we're still going to be challenged to take account of. Um, what are those tips? Um, be proactive in engaging your students. Um, call on that student who's been the entire day. Um, chat that student privately to check to see if everything is okay. And not to like wag the finger at them, but to say, hey, are you tired? Um, is it disruptive for you to be um, removed? How can we get you engaged? What do we need to do to make those adjustments? Um, at the end of the day, just because they miss those hugs and they miss those high fives and we can't be with them physically, they're still our students. Um, they it, it actually still know that as long as we're reaching out to them and really being engaged with them. So um, for as difficult as it is, because we're human beings as well, pouring out, um, continue to reach to those students. They're, they're still there, they're still with you. Um, Melissa just asked a question. Um, what type of drones are used? Um, can Tello be used with other drones? Um, Tello is proprietary to the specific Tello EDU drone. Um, it is a quadcopter with a single camera on the front. Um, if I had to give you a size reference, it's about the size of a salad plate. Um, <laughs> I know that's not great. That's the first thing that popped into my head. Um, diagonally, it's about six inches. Um, so you're not talking about anything massive, nothing heavy. Um, about nine ounces, a little bit 
less than 10 ounces, so we don't have to register that drone with the FAA or anything like that. Um, right now, um, this application cannot be used with other drones, um, but one thing that we're looking forward to in the future is expanding um, our ability to use code. Um, the Tello drone can be programmed not only with Tello EDU, but by opening a command line and programming in Python. Um, we don't have that developed yet, but that's something we're looking forward to bringing in the future. Um, really great question there. And um, if you have any other questions, please absolutely feel free to reach out. Um, this is my contact information. I am um, really simple uh, email address, easy to reach. I'm Desmond at nextwavestem.com. You'll see my face on the slide in black and white. Um, if you look in the corner of your screen, you'll probably see my face in color. Um, <laughs> Next Wave STEM, we are on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, you can reach out to us on any of those platforms. I'm not even going to mention TikTok anymore because I'm not going to do it. So if we get on TikTok, I'll let you know. It just won't be me. Um, reach out to us. We love to connect. Um, my colleague is also, she dropped her email in the chat, so Gundy at Next Wave STEM. If you're interested in getting more information about how to connect with your schools and form partnerships with Next Wave STEM, um, she'll point you in the right direction. Um, but with all that being said, thank you so, so much for being with us. Um, we hope that what you saw, um, what you were able to share, what we were able to share with you today and what you shared with us today is beneficial to you in the classroom as you continue um, with your student STEM journeys, even at a distance. Um, and one thing I almost forgot to mention, um, for our participants, everyone in today, um, we are doing discounted pricing with respect to our courses for the fall for licensing, training, and equipment. Um, so reach out to Scundi. Um, she'll give you the awesome deal that we have available. Um, but for all of you, I give my thanks once again. Um, our next webinar is on Thursday at two o'clock and deals with the subject of considering the arts, um, STEAM and computer aided design. Um, we often think about that A um, that's now making its way into the acronym instead of just STEM, we're considering STEAM. Um, if you have students who really want to learn more about artistic design and um, building in their design skills. Um, join us for that webinar and we'll talk about how we can help you and help them do that. Um, but other than that, thanks again and we will be talking with you all very soon. Bye-bye now.